Good afternoon, everyone. Time for another crypto update. So it's going to be a fairly long one. Uh, been away for a while. Took about a three-week vacation. Apologize to the members and for my public blog because uh, things are being rearranged right now. Um, I'm still in the process of converting everything. For the members who haven't received refunds, you will. I'm finishing processing those. Uh, converting my member site to a free site and the public blog to a my content only. The reason I'm doing that is because uh, just issues with the the ads and revenues and costs and things like that. So, uh, but I wanted to do a crypto update now that I'm back and I uh, want to cover Bitcoin, uh, where it's going as far as the technicals and what I, I believe are the important fundamentals. So just as a refresher, technicals and fundamentals, those are the two most important ways that you look at markets. Technical traders are traders who are basing their buy and sell decisions on price action and volume and support and resistance and trend lines and in different indicators. And the reason that they do that, the basic premise behind technical analysis is that the market contains the sum of the knowledge that the people have. So something similar to if you're familiar with Cliff High's web bot and how it tries to make predictions based on chatter that's out there on the internet, markets are sort of the same way. They're, the price is a collection of all the wisdom of all the players combined, their knowledge, inside information, all that is is contained in price. So by watching the price, the tape, which is just a term that comes from the ticker tape of the old stock market, but the one minute, uh, one minute indicator here on Bitcoin is just as much a tape. The, the minute by minute, second by second price action indicates the information that is being acted upon by the actors in the market. And so technical analysis tries to take advantage of patterns and levels and different things. I've talked about support and resistance and breakouts and things. I'm not going to talk about that again, but so technical resistant, uh, technical uh, analysis is based on that. Fundamental analysis, on the other hand, would be something like what Warren Buffett is purported to do. I say purported to do because I think that's a lot of that's probably just a big hoax, and he's probably an inside person who's just made into what he is by the elites. But the myth of Warren Buffett is that he is just this aw shucks kind of. Nebraska guy who sees undervalued companies, buys them up, and then they they become very valuable. So buying something when it's undervalued, selling it when it's overvalued, that's sort of the fundamental uh, perspective. So fundamental analysis is an attempt to buy something that's undervalued and profit from its rise in price. Technical analysis is an attempt to buy or sell something based upon the pattern of the market and the prices and to try to profit from either a rise or a decline. You can also have a, a fundamental bet against something that's shorting, uh, that's very difficult to do. So you can make money both buying and selling in fundamental and technical analysis. So I wanna cover the technicals on Bitcoin, we've had quite a correction. This is one in a series of corrections. Bitcoin has had many corrections all the way from one penny to $20,000, which is basically what we've run from roughly 2009 through the end of 2017. We had in that eight year period, roughly eight year period, we've had a bull market from one penny to $20,000. That's probably the biggest bull market in the history of the world. I don't know, some people have done some charts to try to compare the tulip bulb thing in the South Sea bubble. We're gonna talk about tulip mania in a minute here when we talk about fundamental reasons for buying cryptocurrencies. But I wanna start off with the technicals. The technicals are 
my technicals that I use are just based upon the major trend lines and the major support lines. So that's what you see drawn in here. This is a six hour chart. We'll pull it out to the daily chart so you can see. Actually, the 12 hour chart will give us everything that we need. So you can see we get down to a price of about $1,000. That was $1,200. That was the top of another one of Bitcoin's many runs. So I've drawn in the trend lines. You can see the longest of the long-term trend lines is this bottom trend line, and you can see that it's pointing to a price of 4,000. That's the price that we would be at if the market just continually rose at the same pace that it has from that point at about 1,200 bucks. It would be at about 4,000 right now. We know that it has accelerated to the upside in sort of a parabolic move. So we got much higher prices than that. But if we return to that trend line, we're looking at a price of about 4,000. The next trend line and support line we have is drawn from this bottom here through this support here. And it comes up to about 6,000. It also, 5,500 to 6,000. That's gonna be the next area that we're talking about as far as support for this market. Now that comes in in two ways. It comes in from that secondary uptrend line, and it also comes in because of this uh, support created by this uh, high that we had, and also this breakout that we had. So you can see we hit a high here of roughly five to 6,000, and then we had a, a good short-term bear market, which is very common in cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin especially. And you can see that it dropped here and then uh, it uh, consolidated, made a bottom, followed the trend line up, and then it broke out right there, at roughly 5,000. It broke out, it ran all the way to eight, it crashed back down to 5,500, 6,000, something like that. So that's gonna be the next level. This is gonna be the next level we're watching as far as a pullback point to where Bitcoin may go. Next level up is the 8,000 level. That gives us this third trend line, which uh, doesn't really have a lot of touch points, but it comes out around 8,000, but also coincides with this top that we had in the sort of last mini bear phase that we had. And we had a run up to about 8,000, and a quick drop down below 6,000. And then you can see same pattern occurred here. We got a test of the old high and a breakout. And you can see it ran from 8,000, uh, just dashed right through 10,000, correct a little bit, and it ran all the way up to about 20,000. Now, ever since 20,000, near the end of the year, or the middle of December, we've been in a correction phase, coming down to touching just below 10,000. So. The big question that everybody is asking is, where is this market going? Is the bull market over? Uh, I'm gonna do my final analysis at the end of this video, my predictions on percentages of where I think it's going, but just to cover the technicals here, the main technical points are this 10,000. This 10,000 support is important because it's a psychological barrier, but it's also where this trend line matches up. It really only has these two touch points, but we had a test below it here where we got down to about 9,000. And we also had another test here where we just touched 10,000. So 10,000 is, that is a level where I have put some buys in. Uh, I had some buys in earlier 12,000, but I got out of those when it, the market rolled over. So I'm still in the process of trying to buy the dip, but ultimately you want to buy uh, the very bottom. That's very hard to do. That's why we're doing this analysis. So 10,000 is one of those buy points. If it gets below 10,000, a lot of people are buying it. Uh, the next buy point that I have, my stop, uh, buy stops are set at exactly 8,000. I figure if we touch 8,000, I want to be in. Now I'm making my buys larger as we get lower. So I also have buys down in this area from 5,500 to 6,000. And that's for significantly larger position than this one here. And then also a much, much larger position all the way down here. As far as uh, 
the percentage chances. I'll cover that later of, of getting to these, but these are the significant buy points that I have. It's 10,000, 8,000, 5,500 to 6,000, and 4,000. That's where I'm looking at where the market may correct to and where I want to buy in. Now, I use scaled in buys, and the reason why I use scaled in buys is I make a, a tiny one near the market, larger one down farther, larger than that, and as, as you go down in price, the larger I buy. And the reason for that is because once you get a bounce, it takes a very, very small bounce uh, to try to catch the bottom to get into a profitable situation. Uh, plus also, based on the fundamentals, which we're gonna cover here in just a second, I do believe that fundamentally we're going higher. In other words, that it's undervalued, the asset is undervalued for what it is, and that ultimately it will go higher. The only question is is how to combine the technicals with the fundamentals to try to find that buy point. So that's what I'm doing with the technicals. Now I wanna to get to the fundamentals, and there's gonna be three main things I'm gonna talk about with the fundamentals. The first one is this argument about the blockchain, and, that, and that's covered very well in this video. Uh, it's from the Corbett Report, but I'm, I'm going to cover the segment that is a speech by Andreas Antonopoulos about blockchain. And I want to talk about blockchain and um, the powers that be in their use of that term, their misuse of that term, and uh, how they use that in their FUD. The second thing I want to talk about is just the type of uh, comments that you get from the ordinary people and probably a lot of shills, et cetera, uh, as far as the arguments against Bitcoin. And the last thing I wanna talk about fundamentals is, uh, is, is Bitcoin like tulip bulbs? Is it a mania? Is it a, is the Ponzi scheme? Is it a bubble? And I'm gonna compare uh, different characteristics of money talking about tulip bulbs gold and ultimately bitcoin but let's start out with this video from andreas antonopoulos covered by the corbett report talking about this issue of blockchain this is called the bitcoin psyop and i want you to hear this part of it so what i'd like to equip you with is a set of criteria to understand when you are being presented with something perhaps to invest, or to be employed, or to engage in some way. And it calls itself a blockchain, or a distributed ledger, or one of these other names that are coming out. How can you tell? Blockchain or bull****? They both start with a B. What's the difference? If you can replace the word blockchain with database, and the brochure reads the same, it's business as usual. It's not decentralized. It's not borderless, neutral, censorship resistant, open. It reestablishes trust in intermediaries. It's just a database, and that is not disruptive. The idea that we're going to take this technology and use it to improve the operating margins of centralized institutions of trust so that they can continue business as usual. I'd, I'd say it's abhorrent, but that's a strong word. It's just boring. Really, really boring. No one got into this in order to make a few billions for a financial services clearinghouse. And if you did, I'm really sorry. That's boring. What's really exciting is the possibility of fundamentally changing the way we allocate trust on this planet, opening up the ability to collaborate, transact, engage on a global level with everyone. Simply by means of downloading an application, you can become part of a giant platform of trust that doesn't care who you are or where you came from that doesn't require permission to participate or innovate. Where a 12-year-old JavaScript programmer 
has the same influence as power as J.P. Morgan Chase. More, in fact, because they're doing open source and feeding into a community of collaboration that is creating a tsunami of innovation. Taking this technology and using it to strengthen the same centralized institutions so that they can improve their bottom line is boring. That is not what blockchain is. That's just a database. And it doesn't change anything. In fact, there are some rather disturbing possibilities in this model. Let's think about it for a second. The most commonly expressed application for these new distributed ledger technologies is to replace the function of a centralized clearinghouse with a consortium of n participants, where n is 2, 3, 4, 5, 10, known, permissioned, controlled participants, who will assemble transactions and sign them, rather than compete through market forces in a security model like Bitcoin. We discard currency as the underlying mechanism for building market-based security. We discard proof-of-work as wasteful, because all it allows you to do is decentralized, secure, neutral, censorship-resistant blockchain. And we trust five named parties to sign transactions. At that point, they don't need to assemble these transactions in blocks. They can just sign the individual transactions. They don't need to chain them together, because absent proof of work and a system of currency incentives, rewriting that is easy. There is no immutability. So it's not a blockchain anymore, because there's no blocks and there's no chain. Now that's at a technical level. But let's look at the more important level. What do you achieve by replacing a clearinghouse with a consortium of players? You know, there's something unique a clearinghouse does. If you understand the role of a clearinghouse, one of its most important functions is that it is not a participant in the market. It has no skin in the game. The New York Stock Exchange is not an active trader. That's not an accident. That's called separation of concerns. The clearinghouse is an independent party with oversight that is not a market participant. If you take that party out and replace it with five banks, all of which have skin in the game, how do you run a consensus algorithm when the incentives to cheat, front run, manipulate the market, and break the consensus rules, even adversarially against the other four parties, are so high. There is no incentive to keep the consensus rules. All you are doing is you're saying, trust us, we are in a consortium. Trust us? These five banks? Where were you in 2008? Where were you when Libor was fixed? Where were you when the gold markets were fixed? Where were you when front-running and high-frequency trading was creating these monsters of crony capitalism? Trust us? Hell no! Removing the clearinghouse and replacing it with... What's the word? It's not consortium. Cartel. That's the word. <laughs> with the cartel of the same market makers who have manipulated and compromised every market in history, and doing that in a way that closes this from transparency, that's not a recipe for efficiency, immutability, security, transparency. That's not a blockchain. That's a bullshit. It's a very profitable bullshit. It requires you to have confidence in the game, a con game, as it's known. Be careful. 
So that is a very good summary of this issue of blockchain. I've talked about this before in other videos of how the bankster, Wall Street, Jamie Dimon, criminal scumbags of the world have tried to expropriate this idea of blockchain and separate it from Bitcoin. In, it's ridiculous because as Andreas is pointing out, blockchain without decentralization and with immutabil without immutability of the database, without blocks, without a chain that's decentralized with an economic incentive to keep the database exact, to keep it right, without that in economic incentive to do that, then blockchain is meaningless. It just means database. And the database is only as good as the people who are keeping it. So even if you have a distributed database and call it blockchain, you're still reliant on, as he term, he uses, cartel, or in some of these not completely decentralized currency, cryptocurrencies, you have nodes. So you have this trusted node or trusted party that is going to keep the records, let's say, or process the transactions. That is no different than the system that we currently have. So you can see here that blockchain, this is their attempt to, as I think he quite appropriately calls it, blockchain or BS, because it's BS. They're just pretending that they are interested in blockchain. Blockchain technology is inextricably linked to Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the creator of blockchain. Now, other cryptocurrencies can use blockchain, but if it's not a true decentralized peer-to-peer -peer cryptocurrency, then it's not a blockchain because there is no way to guarantee that it will not be corrupted. Now, we have other things like 51% attacks and hard forks and things like that. That's another issue. But as far as keeping the mutability of the database, the only way you can do it is through the economic incentives that were originally envisioned by Bitcoin and are now being adopted by other proof of work types of cryptocurrency. So there's the FUD, there's the nonsense, there's the bankster lies. Um, and that is one of the fundamental reasons that I'm talking about, about why Bitcoin is going higher. Because they don't have any arguments. Their arguments are false. Their arguments, as Andreas would say, are BS. They don't have anything. Next thing, let's talk about the FUD that we get when we're listening to Zero Hedge is the site I go to. There's a lot of other sites you can go to. Coindesk, Cointelegraph, Bitcoin Forum, Reddit, Bitcoin. There's a lot of different places you can go. But when you go there, there's a lot of people arguing against Bitcoin. And in the seven or eight years that I've been involved with it, the arguments... Uh, have always been basically two main arguments that they use. The first one is it doesn't work. It's a scam. It, it's a fraud. It's a Ponzi. It's, it, it's broken. It can't work. It'll never work. It's just bits. It's just, it's just ones and zeros. How can that be money? On and on and on and on and on. That argument is proven wrong by the price. The price is proof because... Money is a great motivator for, uh, money in markets are great motivators for innovation and for discovering flaws and finding cheaters, finding holes in the system. There's no way you'd have $11,222 Bitcoin price if Bitcoin didn't work. It works. It works very well. And so do many other cryptocurrencies. So that's the one of the core arguments that they make is that, to quote Jamie Dimon, it's a fraud. No, Jamie, you're a fraud. So the next and related argument that they go to, this is when the normal person becomes somewhat educated as to what cryptocurrencies are and has some level of understanding about how they work. Once 
they get to that point, then they understand that those arguments are nonsense and that the price proves the value and that the technology is valid, it's working, it's all over the world, it's happening right now. Those arguments don't work anymore. So the next argument that they roll out is, well, they're going to stop it. So it doesn't matter anyway. Now let's think about that. They go from arguing that it doesn't work to governments are going to stop it. Well, the first thing you need to observe about that is that if governments need to stop it, that proves it works, or they wouldn't need to stop it. It just simply die. So the fact that governments are trying to stop it proves that it works. Now, I'm going to contend that not only governments trying to stop it proves that it works, but the fact that it works means governments can't stop it because it actually works. And part of its design is to prevent governments or any other quote unquote bad actors, corrupt entities from interfering with this market. So both of these arguments that it's a fraud, it doesn't work, it's ones and zeros, it's not worth anything, those are obviously wrong. And I contend that governments can stop it is also wrong. Governments have not been able to stop BitTorrent. Now, governments have been, admittedly, don't have as much of a stake in stopping BitTorrent and torrent uh, applications simply because government doesn't really have a direct interest in protecting copyrights. They have an indirect interest in that they represent some very, very powerful lobbies, including the music industry, the movie industry, and uh, the software industry. And those all have a very strong incentive to try to prevent copyright infringement. BitTorrent allows people to share copies of software and movies and music. And because of that, they want to stop it. But uh, it originated, uh, music sharing originated with Napster and LimeWire and others like that. But the problem with them was that they had a centralized point. There was a server that contained the information. We know how they shut down Napster. We know how they shut down LimeWire. BitTorrent, on the other hand, is decentralized. The only thing that's centralized in BitTorrent is the tracker sites, such as the Pirate Bay, uh, former BTG Junkie, former Extra Torrent, all these former sites. Uh, those sites were actually collecting trackers. They, they were not collecting the files. They were just telling you who has them. So uh, BitTorrent uh, tracker sites we're just a way for people who have copies of movies, copies of music, copies of software to get in contact with other people who have copies of movies, copies of software on their computers and to be able to share them. But it is decentralized. Now, I personally believe that there is coming, whether it's going to be Florin Coin or Library Coin or one of these uh, cryptocurrencies, there's going to be peer to peer. Uh, torrenting based on a coin that enables some type of library system and then there will not be any point of failure because there won't be a central point that can shut down. They can't go after the creator of Pirate Bay because there won't be a Pirate Bay. There will just be peer-to-peer uh, -peer decentralized cryptocurrency that is connected to some type of decentralized database, maybe perhaps built into the coin itself and shared on all of the systems that trade the coin. And this is going to have the library of magnet links that have access to the uh, information of where the torrents are, and they won't be able to shut it down. So they haven't been able to shut down torrent even as it stands, and it will get even harder for them when uh, torrent-based cryptocurrencies come out. So they can't shut it down, and they're not going to be able to shut down cryptocurrencies. That's why they have this fund. That's why this is a fundamental reason that it's valuable, because... The first argument that it doesn't work is patently wrong and just about everybody knows it. And the second argument that they're going to stop it is also wrong. They can't stop it. So that's the second fundamental reason uh, based on what's out there, why I believe that it's undervalued. 
Now, let's talk about the third reason, and this is based upon the characteristics of money and this common charge that Bitcoin is like tulip mania. Now, if you're not familiar with tulip mania, the Dutch tulip craze that happened in Holland, I believe it was in the 1600s, correct me if I'm wrong. Basically, uh, there was a tremendous bull market in the price of tulip bulbs. Uh, they were sort of operating as money, but also maybe operating as an investment. Sometimes it's a gray area. You can look at, for example, U.S. Treasury bonds. Are they money or they are, are they an investment? Well, they're actually uh, used as money all around the world. So it's kind of a gray area. Same thing with tulip bulbs. Tulip bulbs were traded as an investment because they were going up tremendously in value, but they almost sort of became a kind of money. So I want to look at the characteristics of money and how these different things stack up. And when we do that, when we examine that, we're going to see the fundamental reason of why Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are so valuable. But let's take a look at these characteristics. This is not all of the characteristics. Uh, I don't see fungibility. There's other ones listed, but these are some of the key ones, and I want to go over these things. So let's look at three things. Let's look at tulips, in the, as in the tulip mania, tulip bulbs. Let's look at gold, and look at, let's look at cryptocurrencies, and compare them in terms of these characteristics of money. So let's start out with durability. Objects used as money must withstand physical wear and tear. In other words, if they can be destroyed, then your money can be destroyed and your money can become worthless. That's not something that you want to use as money. Well, what about tulip bulbs? Not so good. Do they have some durability? Yeah, they have some durability. It's a bulb, I guess. It's not, it's not the plant itself, so the bulb is going to be a little bit more durable. But it ages, it rots. There's all kinds of things like that. Durability is very, very low for tulip bulbs. A very, very poor type of money or investment. What about gold? Well, gold is much more durable. They tell us that gold can only be destroyed in a nuclear blast, if you believe that sort of thing. But other than that, gold is very durable. Apparently, we have all the gold that's ever been mined. Uh, it hasn't been destroyed, it's dug up and then buried again, it's hidden by various governments and transferred around the world by central banks, but it's very durable. Uh, it's changed into bars into a form where it can be stacked and measured and things like that, but it is durable. What about cryptocurrencies? Are they durable? Well, they're not physical. So how do they withstand physical wear and tear? The big issue for them is, are they going to go out of existence? Will there be a failure? Will something happen with the software itself? Will it go out of existence? That's the big issue. So the issue for cryptocurrencies is not as much wear and tear, but outright destruction. And I would say that on this one we would have to put gold above cryptocurrencies. But uh, so far from what we've seen, cryptocurrencies are very, very high on the list. So tulip bulbs, yeah, they don't work for durability. Let's look at portability. People need to be able to take money with them as they go about their business. It has to be portable. Well, what about tulip bulbs? No. They are portable, yes. They were importing them from various countries. That was part of the reason why the market for them crashed. But are you really going to carry around tulip bulbs in your pocket? So, no, portability is not very great for them. What about gold? Well, gold is a little bit more so because it doesn't have the problem of it being decayed or destroyed or something like that because of its portability. But at the same time, uh, Gold is not something that you want to carry around in your pocket, especially large amounts of gold, because you can get robbed. So yes, gold is portable, but there are some problems. What about cryptocurrencies? Well, cryptocurrencies absolutely, hands down, are more portable because you can simply have them on your smartphone. You can have them on your tablet. You can have them on your computer. You can send them from one computer 
sitting in America to a computer somewhere in Africa, you can send $100 million worth of Bitcoin in a click of a button. So portability, absolutely, hands down the winner is cryptocurrencies. Let's look at divisibility. Well, tulip bulbs, no, they're not divisible at all. You cut a tulip bulb in half and you don't have half, uh, you know, half a tulip bulb, you have something that's worthless. Because ultimately, hopefully, you're going to try to use it to grow a plant. So cutting it in half makes it worthless. What about gold? Well, gold is divisible, but it has a problem with the divisibility. It has a problem with uh, measuring the coin, whether it's a coin or a bar, the purity of it. It has to have the same purity with gold. We talk about 24 karat, etc., different types of purities. So the divisibility on gold is fairly high, but it's it has issues. What about the divisibility of cryptocurrencies? Well, it's unbelievable. Bitcoin, as an example, is divisible down to eight digits. The single digit uh, seven zeros and a one is called a Satoshi. That's the smallest unit. Uh, current, at current prices, it's still just a fraction of a cent, even with Bitcoin at $10,000. So cryptocurrencies are hands down the winner when it comes to divisibility. Uniformity. Well, uniformity is definitely a problem with tulip bulbs. Uh, no two tulip bulbs are the same by definition. So yeah, there's a problem. Can they be similar? Yes. Uh, can they be close? Yes. Are they uniform? No. Gold. Well, gold can be more uniform, but gold has to be refined. It has to be stamped. It has to be minted. It has to be uh, made to be uniform. Whereas cryptocurrencies are uniform by definition. If we're talking about one particular cryptocurrency, we'll use Bitcoin as an example. One Bitcoin, well, let's look at the definition. Any two units of money must be uniform or same in the terms of what they will buy. Well, one Bitcoin is the same as any other Bitcoin. There's no difference. And uh, I think they use the term fungibility, but uh, uniformity works as well. So uh, there's no question, cryptocurrencies are hands down the winner. Now, if you're talking about Bitcoin versus Bitcoin Cash, the, there's a difference. But if you're talking about one particular cryptocurrency, then absolutely uniformity cryptocurrencies win hands down. Limited supply. Well, tulip bulbs, it just fails completely. Gold, well, we have a limited supply in the sense that only so much is mined. Gold has traditionally been a very important store of value simply because such a large amount of gold has already been mined that the amount of gold that's mined every year that's added to that usually comes, estimates are anywhere from 1% to 3%. So the supply of gold can't really increase dramatically at any one time. Now, the supply of gold that is available to the market could increase dramatically. There's rumors of Yamamoto's gold. There's rumors of gold hidden in the Grand Canyon. There's all kinds of rumors about gold that's not on the market that could come crashing on the market and destroy the price. So limited supply, gold is very, very high in that. But when we compare, compare gold to cryptocurrencies, it definitely is inferior because a cryptocurrency that works like Bitcoin that has a, a fixed 21 million limit there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoins. In the case of Litecoin, it's 84 million. In the case of other coins, it's a different number. It just depends on the coin. And it has to be a coin that does have a fixed supply. There are many coins that don't have fixed supplies. I think one of the most famous or infamous ones is Dogecoin. So you have to definitely do your due diligence and find out if you truly have a cryptocurrency that has a limited supply. But if we're talking about cryptocurrencies that are specifically designed to have a limited supply, yes. Hands down, cryptocurrencies are superior to gold and obviously tulip bulbs. So the last one, acceptability. Everyone must be able to exchange the money for goods and services. So in other words, it has to be popular in a sense. It has to be used by people. If it's not used by people, it's not good for anything. I was just reading recently about the when Bitcoin 
had just been, the white paper had just been written and Satoshi Nakamoto had fired up the first Bitcoin miner. Well, there was no, no other miners online, so he was just mining coins with himself. It wasn't until he actually got people in that meetup and crypto discussion group to start mining too and get involved with it. This is how the thing started. So yes, it takes acceptability. Well, with Bitcoin, well, first of all, let's talk about tulip bulbs. Certainly in Holland during the tulip mania, it was acceptable. Everyone was using it. I don't know if people were actually buying food and things like that. I don't think it was used too much as money, more of an investment. Gold, on the other hand, people would say absolutely all the governments of the world accept it. You can do your reserves in it. It's considered a tier one asset. But at the same time, can you walk down to the corner store and buy anything with gold? Not really. You've got Mark Dice videos of him standing in front of a coin store trying to give away, uh, sell somebody a gold coin for five bucks when it's worth, you know, 1300 bucks. They don't want to do it. So acceptability actually is a lot lower than people would think for gold. Uh, what about acceptability for cryptocurrencies? Well, it's growing by the day. And it's my contention that at some point, Amazon or one of the big players, I think it probably will be Amazon, but at some point, one of the big players is going to start accepting cryptocurrencies as part of their system. Maybe they'll make their own coin, but again, when we've looked at the problems with blockchain not being decentralized, having a single party in control of the value of it, that probably not going to list a lot of trust. So if, for example, let's just say we had Amazon come out and ex announce they're accepting Litecoin as official payments and that they'll have Litecoin wallets uh, on their site, can you imagine what would happen to the price of Litecoin? So the acceptability is increasing every day for cryptocurrencies. And I think it's already beyond the point of no return, honestly. People have been able to buy things with cryptocurrencies for a very long time. So those are the three fundamental reasons. I've given you the technical uh, picture, and now I'm giving you the fundamental reasons. The first fundamental reason is that the only thing they have against Bitcoin is their PSYOPs. They have nothing but FUD and PSYOPs. The second thing is that the arguments against it are completely bogus, that it doesn't work that's just plain wrong, that they're going to stop it? I don't think they can. And the last one, is it the best form of money? Yes, it is. It's better than gold or tulip bulbs or anything else you want to pick in at least five of six of these tests and maybe all six. So is it a fundamental investment. Is cryptocurrency a fundamental investment? Well, let me give you some anecdotal information. I just came across an article the other day where someone cited the fact that the banks earned $6.4 billion last year in overdraft fees. Now, if you're familiar with overdraft protection or overdraft fees, overdraft fee is where the bank charges you when you spend more money than you have in your account. Now, if you think about it, wasn't that a loan? Yeah, it is. It's kind of a loan, but it has fees attached to it, exorbitant fees. And every time you have a transaction where you're above that limit, they charge you $35, $35, so They made $6.4 billion doing that. The market cap of all cryptocurrencies right now is roughly 500 billion, 556 billion dollars. Now, if that was US banks and the world does the same thing, maybe 10 times that, I don't know, maybe not. So 10% of the market cap of all cryptocurrencies is just these criminal fees that banks charge. Sounds like there's a lot of room to grow. What type of overdrafts can you have with cryptocurrencies? Well, you can't. If you don't have it, you can't spend it. That's the bottom line. So that's just some anecdotal information. I also have been, of course, talking to people, going into bookstores, looking at magazines. Go and look at the magazine rack next time you're in, say, Barnes & Noble or one of the bookstores. 
See if you see Bitcoin, a Bitcoin magazine. See if you see Bitcoin mentioned in any of the magazines. Look and try and find any mention of Bitcoin. Go in and try to find a book on Bitcoin. I actually did find a book. It was a halfway decent book, but it took a lot of searching. So anecdotally, the fact that you talk to people, and a lot of people now have heard of Bitcoin, but none of them are buying it. There aren't any magazines or newspapers really talking about it. You'll have an article of FUD here or there, and it's very hard to find any books on it. What does that tell you? That tells you that the adoption is still a very, very small percentage of the population. So let's get back to this idea of tulip mania, because a lot of people are telling us it's tulip mania. Well, as I showed you with these characteristics of money, it couldn't be more different than tulip bulbs than anything you can imagine. Tulip bulbs are one of the worst types of money or investment that anyone could come up with. And the fact that that turned into a mania was probably more had to do with the hyperinflation of the currency um, and just kind of a general madness than to do with the nature of tulip bulbs. Bitcoin is the, and cryptocurrencies are the furthest thing you can possibly imagine from tulip bulbs. So I think you know where I stand on the fundamental picture. The fundamental picture is still, in my opinion, very, very bullish. I think Andreas Antonopoulos is correct that cryptocurrencies are roughly where the internet was in 1992. We know that that was right before the massive growth phase. I think that's where we're at. So I think you can tell from what I've argued that I'm very, very bullish on the fundamentals. Now let's talk about the technicals. Do I think this is going to turn? Yes. It's been already a 50% correction. Now, if you look at these corrections, the first thing I want you to notice is that for the most part, percentage-wise, the corrections have been decreasing. When Bitcoin first started, we had a series of 90% corrections. I don't know if you remember those, but I remember them. I remember Bitcoin running up to 50 bucks and then going back down into around five or six bucks. That's a 90% correction. I remember Bitcoin going over $300 and then crashing down below 10. That's more than a 90% correction. I remember at least three 90% bear markets. But in the recent past, the most recent past, the corrections have been less than 90%, less than 80%. We've seen some 70%, 60%. So it would not be unusual. It would not be outside of the pattern of things that are forming for Bitcoin and the rest of the cryptocurrencies to, to correct 50% here. So I am definitely starting to scale in my buys around this 10,000 price. The last big buy I did was at 10,000. I have some big buys at 8,000. I have some big buys at 6,000. And I really haven't said it at 4,000 because I don't think we're going there. What are the percentage chances that I think we're going there? I think the percentage chance that this is the bottom right here at 10,000, I think there's about a 50% chance. What is the chance that we're going to touch 8,000? That's going to be the bottom. I'll give it about 25 or 30% chance. I only think there's about a 10% chance that we're going to get down to this 5,500 to 6,000 uh, support before we correct and maybe a 5 to 10% chance that we get down to 4,000. So that's where I think we're going. I think we are going up through 20,000. It's just going to be a question of where the bottom gets in and are you aboard? And we'll talk to you next time.